So welcome again, everyone, to this traffic safety webinar sponsored by the North Carolina Governor's Highway Safety Program. This is one in a series of webinars addressing topics of interest for North Carolina's traffic safety professionals. The series is co-hosted by the Institute for Transportation Research and Education at North Carolina State University and the University of North Carolina Highway Safety Research Center. Today's topic is fewer crashes and less delay with new intersection designs presented by Dr. Joe Hummer with the North Carolina Department of Transportation. Joe is the state traffic management engineer with the NCDOT Mobility and Safety Division, where he specializes in alternative intersection and interchange designs. Joe began researching these designs in 1990 He's published numerous articles about them and has an invented several new designs. Joe spent most of his career as a professor at NC State before serving as chair of civil engineering at Wayne State University in Michigan. He returned to North Carolina and joined the NCDOT in 2016 to work on the implementation of new ideas for intersection uh, and uh, intersections and interchanges. So Joe, if you would please uh, share your screen uh, to begin your presentation. Okay, Eugene, uh, I think I lost you. We see your screen, Joe. Do you? Okay. Yep, you're good. All right, good. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't see it, but uh, okay. Um, good. Well, uh, welcome uh, to my presentation on new intersection designs. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, still trying to move this thing over. There we go. That's got a good chance to work. Uh, thank you for joining me uh, this afternoon. And I always appreciate this, a, a chance to um, uh, talk about intersections. Uh, it's going to be a, uh, always a fun hour for me. Uh, look forward to uh, your questions and some discussion afterward. The uh, problem at intersections is a, a large one. Uh, this is a very important topic, I think, from a safety point of view. Uh, this slide shows crash rates, crashes per 100 million vehicle miles uh, across North Carolina. And uh, what the slide is trying to show you here is the uh, effect of uh, no access control. So that's Joe, basically in, in, yes. This is Eugene. Uh, we actually don't see your slides advancing yet. Oh, yep. I thought something was there you go. going on there. Oh, they're back. Okay. All right. You, you got them now? Yes. Okay. There you go. That looks good. Right. It needed to be on that slide, uh, that screen. Okay. That's good. Um, so uh, the intersections matter. These are crash rates per 100 million vehicle miles. And in the middle of the slide, you can see four lane or more divided with no access control, uh, 319 uh, crashes per 100 million vehicle miles. And compare that to the uh, facilities on, on either side in the slide, interstates with uh, less than a third of that crash rate. And then down at the bottom of the slide, uh, roads with uh, partial access control or full access control. And by the time we get back to full access control, again, less than one third of the crash rate. Access control means no intersections. Intersections matter. Uh, roughly on this slide, you can see they matter by about, by about a factor of three in the, uh, in the crash rate. Here's another slide that's trying to, to bring that home. In the, these are 2018 data from North Carolina statewide. Uh, 138,000 crashes at intersections, which is more than uh, the uh, crashes reported at non-intersection locations. 43,000 injury crashes at intersections compared to 36,000 non-intersection, and uh, 400 fatal compared to 900 non-intersection. So maybe you could say that fatal crash is not quite as important in intersections, but injury crashes, all crashes, uh, intersections matter a lot to safety in North Carolina. So what can we do about it? Well, we, we actually know what to do about it. Intersection safety principles, the four on this slide, have been known for generations. Uh, this is not difficult, uh, at least the, the theoretical part. 
the execution, the implementation is the difficult part, getting these in place. But knowing what to do, uh, said we've known, we've known that for, forever. So uh, four main principles of good intersection design. First of all is to minimize the number of conflict points. Uh, in the uh, diagrams in the slide, each dot is a conflict point. That's the meeting, uh, diverging, uh, or a crossing of two traffic streams. Somebody makes a mistake at a conflict point, we get a crash. The conventional intersection toward the top of the slide, 32 conflict points. The RCI, reduced conflict intersection, toward the bottom of the slide, 14 conflict points. Why are RCI safer than conventional intersections? There it is right there, 32 to 14 conflict points. But even better, point number two, we need to separate the conflict points that remain. In the middle of a conventional intersection, that's a big mess there of conflict points. And you know that feeling as a driver, getting hung up in a meeting opening and feeling like you can get hit from any direction. Point number three, let's control the conflict angles. At a conventional intersection, we've got 16 of the black dots. Those are the crossing conflicts, basically 90 degree angle or something close to it with an excellent chance of getting a uh, injury or a fatal crash if somebody makes a mistake in a crossing conflict. In the reduced conflict intersection, bottom of the slide, we're down to just two crossing conflicts. The angle matters. And then fourth, final point, is to reduce the conflict speeds. Nothing preventing a vehicle at a conventional intersection from ripping through at, at uh, 100 miles an hour, whatever speed they choose, but several things helping at an RCI to get the speeds reduced. Signal progression on the major street and the fact that everybody has to turn right from the minor street uh, means that we do a much better job of controlling the speeds. So even if there is a crash, if somebody makes a mistake, uh, we've got a chance to have it be a, a property damage crash and not necessarily an injury or fatal. So, yeah. yes, please. Uh, pardon the interruptions. We've somehow lost your screen sharing. Would you mind sharing your slides oh. again, and yeah. also um, if you can make them full screen. Can uh, do that. Let's try that. I'm getting a message coming up that says it wants me to restart Zoom. Okay, we do see your slides now. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, and full screen, I'm not sure how to do that, actually. Um, Not sure how to go full screen, Eugene. Sorry about I, that. I, well, they're fairly full screen now, so okay. I think we're good. Okay, right. thank you. Okay, yeah, keep me apprised. That was, I knew something wasn't quite right before. It was asking me to reload. That's never a good thing. Um, how about now? You got the next slide, okay? Yes, yeah, okay. We, we're good. All right, so uh, four, four principles of, of good intersection design. Let's create safe intersections. If we follow those out, we know what the safest intersection design is. The safest intersection is an all-way stop. We wish we could put all-way stops at, at every intersection out there. Wouldn't be having this lecture, wouldn't be taking up your time, we could all go on to other things. All-way stop control is, is simply the uh, safest design, intersection design out there. Wish we could put it everywhere. I'm gonna quantify that uh, during this talk in terms of CMF, that's a crash modification factor, and that's the ratio of after crashes to before crashes when we put in some kind of uh, countermeasure. So this, uh, for an all-way stop, you can see on the slide, or maybe you can't, I hope you can, uh, a, a CMF of 0.4, and that basically re means a 60% crash reduction, in this case compared to having a conventional signal there. And a 0.38 CMF, which means 62% crash reduction for injury crashes compared to a conventional signal. Always stops are wonderful. They're also cheap. And the main thing that they do, the main, the main kick that they get is because of the speed control, the fact that most vehicles do stop 
uh, when they're presented with a, a stop sign. Wish we could put all, uh, always stops everywhere that would solve all of our safety problems at intersections, but there's a problem. And the problem is that always stops have a, have a low capacity. They only really fit at uh, picture, like junctions pictured in the slide, uh, two two lane roadways, low volume, uh, that is a serious limitation. So okay, we should put always stops everywhere we can, uh, the world would be a better place. Joe, pause Please. one more second. We did have a suggestion uh, from a viewer, control L may put you into full screen mode. For hey, let's slide. try that, why not? Let's try what control L. There you go. Thanks for that suggestion. Thank you. Uh, next safest, if we can't do all-way stop, maybe we can do a roundabout. So here's a picture of a one-lane roundabout outside the NC State campus. Uh, a really terrific device. We've got a lot of them out there, uh, over 400 across North Carolina, uh, 10,000 across the US, something like that. Uh, CMFs for uh, roundabout, 0.74 for all crashes, so that's okay but the really good news is 0.45 for injury crashes. We put a roundabout, instead of a conventional signal, we reduce 55% of the injury crashes, and, and that's superb. Let's do more of those. Roundabouts get their kick because they control the number of conflict points. We're really down to eight conflict points. They control the angles and they control the speeds. They do a lot of good work in a small space. The problem with roundabouts is they still have a low capacity. They, they're certainly higher capacity than always stop, but the roundabout guide from NCHRP says basically uh, total entering demand for a roundabout uh, tops out at about 25,000 vehicles per day. Go up to a two lane roundabout, we're looking at 45,000 vehicles per day. That's good, but that's, we've still got a lot of intersection space to cover that where roundabout is not feasible. So the search continues and here now, we're getting into the territory of, of really needing some alternatives. Lots of intersections out there, too big for an always stop, too big for a roundabout, still want to have as many of those intersection principles in place to get good safety result. And that's where we come in with alternative designs. Uh, we need other alternatives. Lots of safety features. Yep, we do need higher capacity at a lot of places. And we need some other things too. If we have multiple signals along the roads, we'd like good progression through those signals. Of course, we need to look out for all road users, pedestrians and bicycles, uh, as well as motor vehicles. We need intersections that are good for access, that is driveways, and we need to keep our costs low and keep our impacts low, environmental, social, economic, whatever kind of impacts you're interested in. So a uh, lot of things we're looking at there as we go searching for other intersection designs. So then we're back to this one, which I introduced to you already, the RCI, Reduced Conflict Intersection. North Carolina, we used to call this a super street, also known as an R-cut, reduced uh, crossing U-turn, and a, a J-turn in some other states. So whatever you call it, uh, the idea is on the minor street, which in, this, in the case of this uh, slide, is the uh, north, south, or up and down street. All the vehicles must turn right. And then if they wanna make a through movement or a left turning movement, uh, they actually make a U-turn and then come back to the main intersection and finish the job. We know that RCIs are great for safety. They do a lot of those things that we're looking for as far as safety theory goes. The unsignalized version, we reduce about half the crashes, as you can see there on the CMF and we reduce about two thirds of the injury crashes. So that's, that's some superb performance by RCIs, unsignalized, in other words, smaller side streets or rural locations. The signalized version, we still get pretty good safety performance. You can see there, CMFs of 0.85 and 0.78. Uh, not as good as unsignalized, but, but still reducing 15 to 20% of uh, crashes or injury crashes uh, is darn good. The RCI brings us some other things as well, especially for the major street, it provides higher capacity. We can use that. Uh, it does provide perfect signal progression. So if you put a series of RCIs along a major street, you can time the signals. So basically nobody has to stop on red. RCIs are 
good for pedestrians, much better than a corresponding conventional signal will, would be. And that's because the RCI breaks up the pedestrian path into uh, smaller chunks. And then the uh, fact that there's lower delay as well. More green time uh, for pedestrians means lower delay. A lot of good features that an RCI has. Consequently, uh, North Carolina has been putting RCIs in for 20 years now, since 2000, and we are the world's leader in RCI implementation, so good for us. We've got much more potential out there. We've got something like 200 RCIs in the ground, and in my humble opinion, we should be looking at 20,000. The uh, safety benefits that you saw before, especially the unsignalized version, means that this, in my opinion, is really gonna be the backbone of the system looking out in a few years. The problem that an RCI has, why it's not the universal design, is that the minor street still has low capacity. The, those minor street vehicles that have to turn right and then maybe make a U-turn, uh, you can understand that that would limit their capacity and there's a lot of roads out there where we need more capacity on that minor street. So in those niches, basically where two arterial streets meet, uh, we need to carry on and keep searching. So here's one that is uh, a good niche design. Uh, I don't think we're ever going to get too many of these out there, but in a few places, a median new turn really could help us. Uh, this is uh, the one I grew up with in Michigan. In, uh, uh, up there, uh, we call it the Michigan left turn, and there's a thousand of them. In North Carolina, there's three of them, but uh, we'll, we'll, I think, slowly be introducing more as time goes by. Median new turn uh, has no left turns at the main intersection. All of the left turns have to use those U-turn crossovers, just like the RCI. The picture in the slide shows you the newest median U-turn uh, of our three in North Carolina. This is outside Charlotte, heading toward Monroe on uh, US 74. Median U-turn has an excellent safety record with a CMF of about 0.85, very similar to a signalized RCI. Brings you good capacity, better than a conventional intersection of the same size. It's an outstanding design for pedestrians. If you have to have a high demand pedestrian crossing of a major arterial, that's never a good thing. But if you have to have that, a median new turn is really one of the best ways to get pedestrians across that major arterial. The weakness of a median new turn is uh, it doesn't handle high left turns very well. If you have a high left turn demand, all of those left turning vehicles head down to the left turn crossover, that could be a problem. So the search continues. What else could we do at spots like this? Well, we could do this thing. This is called a CFI continuous flow intersection. And the picture shows you the brand new CFI first in North Carolina outside of Charlotte. This is on the northwest side of Charlotte. That's NC 16, the major street. And the minor street is Mount Holly Huntersville Road. This is just outside the I-485 Beltline in Charlotte. The way a CFI works is on the major street, we cross the left turns over to the other side of the street. Can you see where that shows? I'm not, I'm not sure you can see my cursor here. Maybe you can. Uh, left turning vehicles crossing over to the other side and then running up and storing in this area uh, to the left of the opposing through vehicles. Then when the opposing three vi through vehicles get their green, the uh, left turning vehicles can get their green as well. And that's the magic of a CFI. Moving left turning vehicles at the same time as through vehicles is like the holy grail for traffic engineers. Terrific high capacity for that, uh, for that design. So we're very proud of our first in North Carolina there's uh, several others in uh, various project stages coming soon, and uh, I hope you can see why. CFI gives you pretty good safety. C uh, CMF published a few years ago out of Utah of uh, 0.88, and uh, so uh, safer than conventional intersection of the same size. The main thing a CFI gives you is high capacity, terrific capacity, in fact, really comparable to grade separation. The picture on this slide is of a proposed CFI in Garner, 
US 70 of Timber Drive. And that project was originally programmed as an interchange. That was, we were gonna build a bridge there at vast cost with huge impacts. Somebody suggested to substitute in a CFI instead. It fit easily in the same spot as the interchange would have a fraction of the cost, a fraction of the impacts, and almost the same traffic capacity. So uh, that was, a, I think, a really good idea there and the potential for a lot more projects like that uh, if we look around North Carolina. So CFI's got a lot going for it. The weaknesses of this design, it's, it's not great for pedestrians. I wouldn't say it's unsafe necessarily, uh, but it's just slow. A pedestrian's got to hit a, a, a lot of buttons and wait for a lot of walk signals to get across that thing. And uh, a CFI is not great for driveways. Business access, it, it really struggles compared to conventional or even compared to other unconventional designs. So not perfect. We're, I think we're gonna build more CFIs, but we gotta find the right niche for them. Another contender is this thing, a quadrant roadway intersection, QRI. Uh, the picture shows the one and only QRI in North Carolina. It's been in place since 2012. And the idea here is we prohibit some of the left turns at the main intersection and route that left turning traffic onto that connector road. That has good capacity benefits. Unfortunately, we don't know the safety yet of this. Uh, well, we've got some data back from this location, but we don't have enough safety data yet to generalize. My suspicion is when the dust settles and we've got enough data, we're gonna see a quadrant roadway intersection is about as safe as uh, an equivalent conventional design. We'll see, I've been wrong before. Quadrant is excellent for pedestrians. Uh, fewer signal phases, no left turning traffic, more green time, and actually fewer conflict points as well. If you're in the business of having to move a lot of vehicles and a lot of pedestrians through a particular spot, a quadrant would be an excellent choice to do that. Also good for driveways, as you can kind of get a hint in this picture. Lots of driveways around there with businesses uh, doing very well. The weakness for quadrant roadway intersection is a potential driver confusion. Rerouting those drivers, those left turning drivers to the connector road, making sure they get turned the correct way and then headed back where they need to go. Uh, so lots of signing, lots of pavement marking, uh, great lighting, lots of things necessary to, to make that work. Uh, we've got one in the ground. There's uh, four full designed quadrant roadway intersections across the U.S. and a couple dozen more that were sort of uh, partials or hybrids. So, so we know we can do it, but it just takes some doing, takes some uh, money for especially all of those big signs. All right, onward, if the search still needs to continue, if we need even more capacity, uh, we could go up to a grade separated intersection. So the picture shows one of those that's in Durham and it just works, just goes about its business. Nobody ever thinks about it, hardly anybody knows it's there, but uh, you can see it's basically the quadrant roadway intersection uh, design, but with a bridge instead of a main intersection should be relatively safe. There's the, the individual pieces look pretty safe here, but we don't really have any uh, scientific data yet to, to be able to prove that. Outstanding capacity should be good for pedestrians. It should be good for driveways. A design like this has a lot going on for it. The problem with this design is actually that we also don't have much history with these. In a lot of places across North Carolina, a lot of places across the US, in the past, designers stuck in a full interchange at a place like this. That means merges and diverges, weaving areas, uh, high speed roadways, lots of space uh, taken up, loop ramps and everything else. Uh, lots of bad examples out there of designers using an interchange where they really should have used something like this, an intersection a great separated intersection, take advantage of the bridge. Yes, let's get the high capacity that we need, but also let's not design a high-speed interchange and uh, get people 
feeling like they're on a freeway when they're not. Okay, if you're not still uh, uh, satisfied with that menu so far, let's extend the menu out a little bit. Let's go a la carte. Uh, what if we combined some designs? What if we came up with partials or hybrids? Uh, and certainly those are possible. Here's a, a sample of those that are possible. My point here is really that there's a lot of intersection designs. Uh, if you go looking for what's the, what's the best design in any particular spot. The one on the left is a reverse RCI that allows left turns out from the minor street instead of rerouting all of the minor street traffic to the right. The picture on the right of the slide is called a bow tie. So that's a median new turnstile intersection where we use roundabouts, two roundabouts, instead of the U-turn crossovers. This is, in my estimation, the most pedestrian and bicycle friendly design that we can provide for a major junction. Joe, if, quick, quick pause. Are you able to was, use your um, uh, mouse cursor on the photographs to illustrate, yeah, yep. indicate? Can you see Thank, it? Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah, okay, very good. Yep, yep. So two roundabouts, Instead of U-turn crossovers, no left turns at the main intersection, all left turning traffic turns right, comes around the roundabout, and then comes back through at the main intersection. So the great benefit to a bow tie design is a pedestrian and bicycle, short crossings, lots of green time, minimum conflict points. It doesn't get better in my estimation for a pedestrian and bicycle crossing major intersection than at one of these uh, bow tie designs. We have two of these bow ties that I know of uh, in the design process right now in North Carolina. These would be the, the first in the world as far as I know. Again, the, the main intersection, the spot's too big for a regular roundabout, but if you put two of them and they're on the side street, uh, we can finesse it that way. Here's a couple other partial and hybrid designs. Top of the slide, this is a partial median U-turn, MUT. Left turns allowed from the side street but on the main street, left turning traffic comes through the main intersection, fills up this turning bay, makes its U-turn, comes back, and then right turn. So this is a, a combination of a conventional design and a median U-turn uh, that has uh, some good advantages in places. A little bit extra capacity compared to a conventional design, uh, but on the other hand, uh, still good for pedestrian driveways, et cetera. Bottom left of the slide, here's a combination of a CFI and a median U-turn. Uh, we've got a couple of these in the design pipeline at the moment in North Carolina. This one that I'm showing you is from Eden, North Carolina, north of Greensboro. And then finally, this little one over to the side of the slide is a quadrant roadway intersection uh, with a roundabout feature. Point is here, you've got lots of choices. Whatever your design objectives are, uh, you don't have to settle for just conventional or just one of the uh, sort of uh, adopted uh, alternative designs at this point, partial and hybrid designs out there that really could help us. Putting all of that together back on safety, what is the safest design? If you started out a project or looked at a particular spot and said, my objective here is to put in a design that is feasible that will handle the traffic from a capacity point of view, but among all the feasible designs is the safest one possible. Uh, you come up with this chart, which I call the SAFED chart, safest, safest feasible intersection design. My paper on this chart was just published in the ITE journal, came out, uh, I got it in the mail on Saturday at my house. Uh, so hopefully you pick that up and, and take a look at that again what is the safest among the available intersection designs. Uh, this is the chart that applies for all crashes. And you can see, I basically talked through the choices with you. All way stops for the smallest of the intersections with the major street on this side, meaning the minor street on this side. Uh, then when the all way stop gives up, we've got one lane roundabouts. And when they give up, we've got RCI, reduced conflict intersections unsignalized version, then signalized version, and then at the very biggest intersections, the safest thing you can do is that median U-turn. And these are all based on uh, peer review published uh, CMFs. 
the accompanying chart that's in the paper, uh, and I'm also informed uh, or reminded, is also on our website in uh, congestion management uh, here at NCDOT, uh, that the uh, injury crashes gives you a very similar chart, uh, except two lane roundabouts pop up in the middle of this chart as the uh, safest design at uh, a lot of combinations. And to me, the safest design should be the default. If you start a planning process, start a design process with anything but the safest design, uh, I've got to kind of question where you're coming from these days. Start with the safest as the default, and then there's lots of reasons that you can't uh, end up choosing the safest design, but at least the burden of proof should be on the proponent of the design that is not the safest according to the available science. Okay, and I think I just jumped that slide, but that's the, uh, the point that I was trying to make there. Safed out of the chart, to me, should be the default design that we start with. All right, uh, last point that I've really got to make here is uh, public acceptance. At, at this point in our uh, research and development process, alternative intersections, like I said, NCDOT has been doing them for 20 years, the profession as a whole for 30 or 40 years, but we haven't sold the public yet. We haven't sold the politicians, we haven't sold the media. Here's a couple of comments just from the last few months that I've received. Uh, a town manager uh, told his board uh, about a, a RCI project. Based on what we've seen, it just doesn't seem friendly to our business community. Thank you very much. Here's a comment from an auto parts retailer. Uh, if it would be ideal if NCDOT just leave our access points unchanged and focus on adding traffic lanes. Uh, the public thinks all of our traffic problems are solved with widening or with signal installation. The public has no idea that there's these this set of other designs that move traffic better and move traffic safer. This is our main hurdle these days uh, as, as a DOT, getting past the uh, public resistance and the political and the media resistance as well. So here's our strategies to, to deal with that, to try to get the safest design in place. Uh, first of all, we try to be opportunistic. Don't miss a chance. If we've got a chance to get in a roundabout somewhere, we got a chance to get in an unsignalized RCI, fantastic, let's not miss that. Second, let's do investigate the, the widest range of alternatives. Maybe, maybe we can find one that most people are if not happy with, at least they can live with. Uh, third, we do need good research. Safety research, capacity research, research on environmental impacts, research on pedestrian and bicycle movements. Science, especially in North Carolina, I think science still matters and tends to win arguments. Fourth, we need to educate our fellow professionals, and that's why I'm here today doing this with you. And fifth, we need good public relations. Our communication staff at NCDOT is terrific. We need more of that. Videos, animations, good, good slideshows, uh, uh, whatever, whatever tools we have available to try to get the idea across. And then we need to be consistent. Business owners need to know we're not picking on them. Theirs is not the only auto parts store that's getting an RCI in front of it. Their competitor auto parts store down the street will begin an RCI sooner or later as well. All right, last two points there. We need to compromise when necessary. And then finally, we need to choose to do nothing if necessary. My analogy is in this business, we're playing poker, especially with our political uh, leaders. And a good poker player never reveals his or her hand until they have to. Luckily, in our hand as planners and designers, we have at least 21 different ways we can compromise. I like to think of these as the cards in my hand and I play them when I need to, to make a compromise, to get a project in place when I'm meeting tough resistance, uh, to try not to have to go to the do nothing alternative. So uh, it's not meant to um, uh, be read here, I'm running out of time, but uh, 21 different ways that we can soften up. Now, any one of these, these are for RCI projects, any one of these means you get a lesser RCA project than the pure one, and we're probably giving up some measure of safety when we make a compromise. But I'm gonna maintain almost always, we're still better compromising 
in getting the project built than if we have to go to the do nothing and just give up. But a word on that. If we have to choose do nothing, let's, let's do that. Let's not build a crappy project. Let's not throw our money away on another conventional intersection that's gonna cause way too many crashes, injuries, and, and fatalities. There's cases out there I know of, I've been around long enough, where NCDOT has had the courage to do nothing, take its money and spend it somewhere else. And you know what? Those politicians will be back in a few years asking us again, can we do something for that problem intersection? The problem's not gonna go away, but our money can go somewhere else until they're ready to see that we've got a safer design for them. So this takes courage. Our leadership is willing to do this. Uh, it's a tough thing to choose, but they can do it if they need to. And, and you know, we should do that. A word on automated vehicles. In my opinion, they're coming soon. Soon, I mean within a couple decades. Right now, we're designing for the year 2045. And certainly by the year 2045, I think there'll be uh, some high percentage of automated vehicles among our fleet, especially in our urban areas, Raleigh and Charlotte uh, leading the pack. Who knows, 30%, 50%, 70%, I don't know, but certainly bigger than zero. Luckily, as far as I can tell, the designs that I've shown here, you here today will also work well with automated vehicles. The traffic fundamentals are still in place. Reducing conflict points works well for human drivers and seems to work well for machine drivers. And then the really good news about automated vehicles is they let us do more things like this. This is called a dynamic left turn intersection. And we're testing this right now in Cary outside of Raleigh. Yeah, I don't know if the, you can see very well on the slide, but on, it's a dual left turn lane. During peak times, we show them that they can use both left turn lanes. And during non-peak times, we close the rightmost of the left turn lanes. All the left turning vehicles should be in the left lane. And then therefore we can use a flashing yellow arrow signal and that saves delay for everybody around the intersection. We hope this works so far so good in carry. The point is with automated vehicles, we're gonna to get to do all kinds of neat things like this. Time of day, day of week, cycle by cycle variations, virtual roundabouts, virtual super streets, virtual one way streets, because we won't have a driver misunderstanding problem anymore. That's gonna be superb. Okay, wrapping up, uh, I'm an old researcher, so here's some research needs that we still have in this area of safe intersections. Uh, you know, traffic control devices, of course, geometric design details still out there. Of course, we need more CMFs and other kind of safety research. Safety surrogates, Surrogate is a uh, quantitative measure that's not based on crash data. In other words, other clues for safety, and we need some of those as well. We need research on the business impacts, so we get good answer to that town manager that I quoted before, and we need what are called ICE guidelines, intersection control evaluation, to make sure at every intersection, every project, we consider the full range of the menu. In summary, Intersections are critical. We need to do good intersections, but we, we know what works. This, it's been around for decades, no surprises here. It's all about conflict points, separating, managing angles, speeds, all of that. We have good designs that implement those principles. And if we use the safe hit chart, well, we get a good start at that. Picking out the default intersection design that we should be at least starting with and going forward in the project process. We choose the best alternative for each spot and then we're gonna get resistance and we need to have strategies to overcome that and I covered those with you and I hope those make sense. So thank you. Uh, this is a picture of my grandson, two year old. Uh, I watch him play and I see he he knows how to cure traffic jams probably better than I do at this point. So let's go learn from the two-year-olds out there. Uh, let's go fix some traffic jams and uh, uh, let's create some safe and efficient intersections. I love talking intersections. There's my phone number, there's my email. 
after this is over, anytime, call me, email me. Uh, let's talk some more intersections. Let's go fix some traffic jams. Thanks a lot. I'm going to try to go find the uh, Q&A pod at this point. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, if you'll yeah. open up the Q&A pod, we do have a few questions in the queue. Um, the, um, a few questions have risen to the top, uh, and several of them related to pedestrians. So I think that's a, um, you might want to spend a moment addressing that. Um, a few, uh, um, I think the better, the, the best question is rather the second question is what criteria do you look at when determining a particular intersection is good for pedestrians. Uh, there's oh, some comments it. about um, the complex, I guess the complexity of crossing multiple streets or multiple streets. Um, how is that really good for pedestrians? So so what, what do you look at when you're uh, determining if a design is good for pedestrians? Yeah, that's terrific. Thank you for that, the, that question. Uh, actually giving a webinar tomorrow on that topic. Uh, the uh, idea is it, the webinar tomorrow is for NCDOT only, but we'll be rolling it out to uh, uh, others outside NCDOT in the coming weeks and months. Uh, the answer is uh, new research out from NCHRP Project 7-25. Uh, I was lucky enough to be on the panel to guide that research, uh, and the research was trying to do exactly what the questioners are talking about, measures to judge the quality of, of pedestrian and bicycle experience at any intersection. What they came up with is a measure, uh, a method that's called the 20 flags method, uh, basically looking at 20 different aspects of the pedestrian or bicycle crossing experience. It's uh, hopefully everything you can think of that's important to a pedestrian or bicyclist. Uh, crossing time, crossing distance, is there a grade change? Uh, how many stages to the crossing? Are there left turn vehicles? Are there right turn vehicles? Uh, is, are there uh, unmarked crossings, uh, et cetera. I think I named six of the 20, uh, but uh, it's really all the aspects there. Uh, you look at that for each crosswalk, you look at that for each bicycle movement, towed up the numbers, and uh, in the end, uh, and by now, uh, over uh, several months or several years that I've been on the research panel, looked at a lot of different intersections. Yep, the alternatives are the better ones because they shorten the crossing distances for each stage they reduce the number of conflict points for each, each um, not for each stage, overall number of conflict points, uh, and many of them reduce the distances and so on. Uh, we've got to get out of this mindset that says conventional intersection is the best for pedestrians. It's the most common for pedestrians, but it's really, especially at these big intersections like I was presenting, uh, a pedestrian or bicycle crossing one of those big intersections with a conventional is really a pretty horrible experience. We can do better, and most of the alternatives uh, do better in terms of uh, all of those dimensions. Joe, thank you. Um, next question, um, and this came up early in your presentation. Um, are you proposing that always stops at all low volume intersections uh, to reduce crashes? Uh, for example, residential neighborhood streets? Yeah, thank you for that, that question. Uh, uh, no, I'm certainly not. There's, there's probably a level of low demand uh, at which the all-way stop doesn't make any sense anymore. But what I can tell you is I don't know what, that the research has found that level yet. Uh, it it, it prob probably exists. There's some, some level at which the motorists really don't obey that all-way stop anymore. Uh, but at a, uh, a, a lower level of demand, but not the lowest level, the research is very clear that all-way stop is the safest intersection design we have out there. So uh, I, I would be, uh, and this is just Joe talking, not NCDOT, not any particular city, but uh, uh, you put me in charge, I'd be uh, putting a lot more always stops out there because the safety record is just superb. You, point, point 0.4 CMF, reducing 60% of your crashes for a countermeasure that costs $400 is, is off the charts benefit cost, and I just don't understand why we don't more, do more of it, other than again, the, the bad publicity. It's got, a bad, it's got a bad name out there, it's been abused out there. People, uh, especially politicians, want to always stop at the end of their driveways. But if we stay short of abusing the device and put it in places where we have two relatively low demand streets meeting, we can do a lot of good out there very cheaply. 
Thank you, Joe. Um, another question that came up um, early or in your um, uh, presentation was talking about multi-lane roundabouts. Um, the question is how much additional capacity for multi-lane roundabout? Um, hopefully uh, you still understand the context of that question. Sure do, yep, yep, thank you. Um, so, so single lane roundabout tops out at about 25,000 vehicle per day, total entering vehicles and two lane roundabout tops out at 45,000 vehicle per day. Again, adding up all the entering vehicles. Uh, North Carolina, and as far as I know, nowhere else around the US has had any success with anything more than two lane roundabouts. Uh, in fact, back in Michigan, where I worked for some years and where I'm from, they tried some three lane roundabouts and they were pretty disastrous. So uh, most engineers I know, we're gonna, we're gonna top off at uh, two lane. So 45,000 is the key number. Look out there in, in your design year uh, for a total entering volume of 45,000 or less to get in a two lane roundabout, 25,000 vehicle per day or less to get in a single lane roundabout. Thank you, Joe. Um, a comment earlier uh, talking about left on red being legalized. Um, the, uh, attendee said, signalized R cuts and MUTs could work better in North Carolina. Any thoughts on legalizing left turn on red? Uh, that we should have done it 40 years ago. Yes, absolutely correct. Uh, and that's, let, let's separate these. Uh, what I'm talking about here, and I think what the commenters were talking about, was a left on red at the end of a U turn crossover. Uh, left on red has got resistance in the legislature because of people thinking about downtown, the meeting of two one-way streets, and that's not at all what I'm thinking about. So uh, our, uh, I don't know if we've gone to the legislature yet with this, or we've tried to draft legislation about this to somehow separate those two cases. And the, the one that, that the commenter is absolutely correct with, uh, the left turn on red at the end of a U-turn crossover, where there's no pedestrians involved at that place, and, and the real, real objection is blind pedestrians. There's certainly no blind pedestrians uh, crossing at the end of the U-turn crossover. So yes, we need to get that through the legislature. Uh, there's no reason not to, except that we haven't just found the right words yet to, to articulate that correctly. But when we do find the right words, let's get it through the legislature and that will make a, a very nice difference to our RCIs and METs. Very good. Very good. Next question. Um, Joe, um, the writer says, at the beginning of your discussion, um, I think you mentioned the basis of all crash data was on four lane roads. How does this compare to two lane roads, especially in urban settings? Uh, do you have a comparison between four lane standard intersection and two lane reallocation with bike lanes and roundabouts or a road with this design, but the same ADT? And how would that compare not only with traffic flow, but also with safety? Right, if I, if I uh, understand the, the question, it's uh, really we're talking about a, a road diet, a reallocation to, to try to go from a four lane roadway to a, a two lane roadway. And uh, that's, that's yet another topic. And I really don't know the research of that uh, uh, all, all that well. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass, pass on that actually. Uh, what I was presuming and what the literature shows that I was referring to uh, was uh, for always stop roadways and uh, single lane roundabouts, uh, those were two lane roadways and that part of the safety chart actually, two lane road meets a two lane road, uh, always stop, two way stop, single lane roundabout and conventional signal are pretty much the really main contenders in that space. Uh, and then when we get up to larger intersections, four lane meets two lane, four lane meets four lane, I understand where the questioner says, well, maybe there's another possibility there of taking a four lane road and making it into a two lane road. Uh, granted, that's, that's possible, but uh, uh, that, that's a, a more complex issue, a lot of moving parts there. And uh, you know, I re I'm really not prepared with that, um, you know, knowing about the safety research of that uh, at, this, at this point. Okay, thank you, Joe. Um, so the question um, came up when you were discussing automated vehicles. How does an automated vehicle understand a dual left turn with one lane shut down versus using both lanes? 
Yeah, ac excellent. Thank you. Um, and the automated vehicle will be able to sense those kind of things from uh, several different several different ways. Uh, first of all, it could be uh, pre-programmed, essentially already mapped in that it, you know, if I'm uh, an automated vehicle coming through this intersection at uh, uh, 2 p.m., a non-peak time, uh, that the right most left turn lane is usually closed at this time. That so could, could already be in the algorithm. Uh, then the automated vehicle also have a set of sensors that will look up at the traffic control device and uh, see that the red X is being displayed. And uh, the automated vehicle will probably be getting uh, communications uh, from us in a so-called uh, V to I, or in this case, I to V, the infrastructure sending a message to the vehicle that says, hey, uh, the, left, left most, uh, the right most of the left turn lanes is closed ahead. So uh, sensing technology, communication technology, uh, pre-programmed pre uh, in the map, and there's probably more ways than that, but uh, most automated vehicle uh, uh, technology that I know of will, will be getting these messages uh, several different ways. Joe, thank you. Let's see if we can squeeze in our last question here. Uh, could the dynamic left turn be used for left lanes off the main line at the U-turn locations on an RCI? Uh, we've got some locations with the dual lefts for the U-turns and the volumes aren't always high enough to utilize both turn lanes. Uh, yeah, hey Janet, uh, I, I can see that. I, I think that uh, could, could have some potential. Um, where we, you know, sort of, I don't know about automatically, but but our, our reflex is to build in two lane crossovers these days, and, and, and that's fine. But instead of uh, striping out one, uh, and then sometimes awkwardly we, we need it, maybe we could do that electronically and just close one when we don't need it for that those portions of the day. So uh, I, I, I can see that. Uh, there'd be a matter of uh, designing the uh, Traffic control devices, you know, where exactly we put the red X's. Are, are the red X's enough? Do we need other devices? So, so we have to put some, some thought into that, what the devices look like, what the messages are. But um, I, I see where you come from. It's, it's got some, uh, I think that's got some potential. But the one uh, implication there too is that once we've got the uh, single lane operation in place, we could go to flashing yellow arrow or uh, back to the uh, questioner uh, a little bit ago, if we had left turn on red that was legal in this state, then the vehicles could make the left turn on red out of a single lane where they probably couldn't do that out of the dual lane. So that, those would be the advantages there. Yeah, very good. Okay, we'll do one more. Um, squeeze this last one in here. Uh, is there a place for multi-lane all-way stops, perhaps coupled with auxiliary through lanes on roads where capacity of always stop wouldn't be enough with a single lane? Yeah, good good question, David. Um, I was in California a few years ago, uh, Irvine, Mission Viejo area, uh, driving around looking at the scenery a little bit, actually me looking at the scenery and looking at the roadways. And it's crazy out there, they've got these huge multi-way stop intersections, uh, five, five lane cross sections basically, meeting two five lane cross sections controlled by a multi-way stop. Uh, somehow it works for them, crazy Californians. Uh, I don't know. It, it didn't, didn't look very healthy to me. I'd, I'd need to see the research, California or wherever else they, they actually tried that, got some in place, and let's take a look at what the CMS look like and what the driver understanding and what, what the compliance is uh, with those conditions. I'm a little suspicious that, that based on what I saw out there, that, that look like a lot of intersection to control just the only stop. All right, Joe, thank you very much. Um, and thanks for the great questions, everyone. Um, fortunately, we're running out of time here um, to, um, but uh, look, we did get to all the questions in the queue or nearly all of them. So I wanna thank uh, Joe again for your presentation. I wanna thank everyone uh, to join us today. Before you actually uh, exit out of the webinar, if you would not mind using the Q&A window, if you have any additional suggestions to help us improve the webinar series, including future topics um, you'd like to learn about, uh, you can just open up the Q&A and uh, add that uh, there. 
Um, if uh, we were unable to get to your question during the webinar, um, we'll share those, all the questions with Joe and uh, we'll try to get a response to you offline. Uh, and definitely remember to watch your um, email. Um, we'll follow up with you uh, with a link to the recording in case you missed any part of the presentation. Uh, including in that email, uh, there will be also a link uh, to show you where to download Joe's slides if you'd like to have that information uh, for future reference. Uh, we put, put that link in the chat window, but it, the slides are posted online. We'll make sure you get that link as well. Um, uh, with regard to certificates, if you are a professional engineer participating in today's live webinar, uh, we're going to, we've got a certificate uh, for you if you need it, uh, awarding one PDH uh, approved for your continuing education requirements. Um, if you're not a PE, but you would also like to get a um, uh, certificate um, for PDH credit, uh, just let us know uh, when we send you out the follow-up email, just give us a reply back and say, yes, send me a certificate. Uh, we'll send you out a, um, a PDF version of that for you. Uh, we want to invite you to join us again for we sort of some other traffic safety webinars. We have uh, also have our plan for this series. Uh, you can visit uh, the website at the link on your screen for a listing of uh, uh, upcoming webinars, as well as in-person training workshops when we are able to uh, uh, resume in-person training um, after COVID-19 uh, restrictions are lifted. Uh, but right now we really appreciate you joining us for these webinars and we hope that uh, they are valuable to you. Uh, at the website, you'll also find information about the next North Carolina Traffic Safety Conference and Expo, which will be coming up uh, in August of 2021. Uh, we hope you'll be able to attend the conference and we welcome you to propose any topics for conference presentation. Uh, at the website, you'll see a link that says presentation proposals. If you have an idea on a topic, you'd be interested in, in presenting at the conference. So with that, uh, I want to thank you all again for participating in today's webinar and goodbye for now.